Well, this is week number four of the Being Challenge. We are spending time in this series here in worship, in small groups, and in daily reading from the books that we have for, for adults and for kids look just like this, learning from Jesus. We're taking up on his beautiful invitation in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, where he says to us, come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Now, so far, we've spent time learning about that from the first two keystone habits of Jesus, things that he practiced and taught that when we do them have impact in many areas of our life, kind of a little bit of a domino effect. They are habits that that help us to learn that unforced rhythm of grace. In week number one, we learn the importance of committing to community, that since the very beginning of time, we have been created, created to do life together with one another. It's messy. It's hard. It needs a lot of forgiveness. But when we are surrounded by people who are also called to faith by Jesus and together we're pursuing Jesus, it's a beautiful thing. This past week in in week number two, we learned a lot more about our identity by spending time studying scripture, the word of God, By spending time in that word of God, with spending time with our creator and walking with Jesus in the word, we better understand who God is. And at the same time, we better understand who we are in light of that truth. He is the one who gives our lives meaning and purpose and direction greater than anything we could find in ourselves or in this world. After all, He declares you and he names you to be his very own beloved children. And in the waters of baptism, he assures that declaration over you. Now, I want to say something here. If you aren't up to date with your daily readings, if you missed a small group meeting, don't give up. One of the things I I forgot to warn you about this in the Being Challenged journey is that you will be attacked on this journey. You will be attacked by the world, your own sinful flesh, by the devil himself as you go through this. Devil doesn't want you to experience life in an unforced rhythm of grace. He would rather you be frantic, busy, isolated, cut off from community, panicked about politics, immersed in work, overwhelmed with responsibilities, and feeling just just out of control. Because that's when the devil, the old evil foe, likes to attack you. That's when he likes to make you forget your identity, who you are, and who Jesus is. I love what Peter, who experienced this a lot in his life and walk with Jesus. I mean, just read the gospel. See, see how, but, the, but, but in a letter, he shares the wisdom that he learned in 1 Peter 5 verse 8. He says, be careful. Watch out for attacks from the devil, your great enemy. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for some victim to devour. So if you've been devoured, if you've felt under attack, if you've given into that attack and into temptation, into sin, I want to remind you that Jesus doesn't just show us how to live life to the full. He is there to pick you up, to cover you with his mercy, his grace, and his forgiveness. On his cross, he bore all of your brokenness and sin, and by his resurrection, he offers to you a different and better ending to your story than the one you can write on your own. He writes a story of forgiveness and redemption in which he has bought you back with his own precious blood and invites you back in time and time and time again. He'll never stop inviting. He'll never stop pursuing. He loves you too much because he wants you to learn from him and follow him and experience life to the full in an unforced rhythm of grace. This week, we're going to pick up another keystone habit in week, this week three, well, week four of the series, week three of learning different habits. And it's the keystone habit of prioritizing prayer. As you think about prayer, let me ask you, how do you feel about your prayer life right here in this moment? Scale of one to 10. How is it? 10 being great, one being, I don't pray. What does it look like? 
Do you have people you pray with? Are there specific times you pray each day? Are there prayers that you have memorized? Maybe this question. Think back on this past week and the prayers that you prayed. And let me ask you this. If God answered all of your prayers with an affirmative yes, he answered them. Yes, no, maybe, wait, you know, kind of that kind of stuff. Uh, but what if everything you've asked of him in prayer this, this past week, what would have looked different in the world today if he answered yes to all your prayers? If I answer that question for myself, let me be honest with you, there'd be some weeks where the world wouldn't look all that different. I mean, good things, good things would have happened. The pandemic would be over. New people would come to church. The Cleveland Indians would have won the World Series. My kids would have done well in their online school for another week. My, life would have, my, my wife, rather, would have had a great week managing our chaotic household. A couple people would have gotten new jobs. Our sponsored child, Samuel, through Bridge of Hope, would be doing well. His family would have what they need. A few people would be healed of some things that are going through in their lives, physical, mental, relational. There'd be some good things. But nothing earth-shattering. I mean, it honestly can be a pretty convicting question for me some weeks. So I'm excited to grow in this area right along with you. Because over 50 times, Jesus, in the written eyewitness accounts of his life, spent time either praying, doing it himself, or teaching about prayer. There are so many of them to look at and so much to learn from Jesus that I hope you spend time this week. You got to be in that book, right? Be in that book, be in a small group, find out more at Red Letter or being uh, St. Paul, Texas slash being, stpaultexas.com slash being for more of the resources in there. I want to grow in this area and I want you to grow in prayer as well. I know that I definitely have not arrived where I want to be yet. And it's comforting. It's comforting to know that, that I'm not the only one. Even Martin Luther. Martin Luther, you know, like our church, Luther and St. Paul Lutheran were, were named after this guy. But he admit when it came to prayer in response to a letter or a little pamphlet, I guess, that he wrote to his barber by the name of Peter, who asked him about prayer. And Luther writes this. He says, sometimes I feel I am becoming cold and apathetic about prayer. This is usually because of all the things that are distracting me and filling my mind. We have, to absolutely be, we have to be absolutely certain that we do not allow ourselves to be distracted from the genuine prayer. The devil is not lazy. He will never stop attacking us. It is such a good idea then to start your day first thing early in the morning by praying and then make it the last thing you do at the end of the day. This way, you can prevent lying to yourself by saying, oh, I can wait a little while. I'll pray in an hour or so. But first I need to do this or that. It is this kind of thinking that will have you believe something better or more important than prayer, particularly if some emergency demands your attention. Love Luther's words there in a simple way to pray that he wrote to his barber. You know, it was something the earliest followers of Jesus that we call disciples also wanted to grow in as well. And they actually asked Jesus directly for help in this area. One day that it happened uh, on, and it's told to us by Luke in his account of it in chapter 11. And it happened after Jesus himself had just finished praying that they made this request of him in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, Lord, teach us to pray. Now Jesus responds to that request with the words of the Lord's prayer. It's not the only time that the Lord's Prayer is taught by Jesus. Matthew, in his gospel, has a, another version of it, a little bit longer and probably closer to the one that maybe you've even memorized. It doesn't mean that Luke got it wrong and Matthew got it right, but probably that more than once Jesus taught his disciples to pray using some pretty similar words. Here in Luke, he says it this way, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. Now after these words, Jesus illustrates for them why they are to pray in this way. And we'll get to that in a moment. But before we do, I've got another question for you. Who taught you how to pray? Do you remember? I mean, did someone purposely and intentionally sit you down and, and teach you what to say, to, to fold your hands and to, to close your eyes, to maybe be on your knees? Who taught you? How'd you learn? For me, it was more caught along the way than simply taught formally. 
even as a young age. I can remember sitting down for dinner that we always thanked God and asked him to, to pray or ask, uh, prayed and thanked him for our food. We would ask him to bless our food with words like these, come Lord Jesus, be our guest and let these gifts to us be blessed. A version of which we still say with my own kids nowadays, thanks to my wife's influence, it's changed a little bit because she learned a little different version and we pray now, come Lord Jesus, be our guest and let this food we eat be blessed, and let there be a goodly share on every table, everywhere. At night, I would pray with my parents and my brother, who I shared a room with before we went to sleep, with words from other memorized prayers like this one. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Honestly, looking back now, those are some pretty scary words to, to pray for, for a young child, even if they are, are true. You know, we would then follow that prayer with a prayer that had each person's name in our family, as well as other people in our lives that we would pray for, that God would bless them, from mom and dad to our bus drivers and babysitters. And then together, we would pray the Lord's Prayer. Now, I mention that to you because for those of you who are parents or grandparents or have some influence over children, it's amazing how impactful set regular times of prayers with your kids and your grandkids can be. And I want to tell you, it's never too late to start. In fact, if you haven't started, tonight would be the perfect time. The next meal would be the perfect time. It might feel awkward at first, but it's worth it. In fact, we got some suggestions for you in the links below for, for all ages of some practices that may, and suggestions that, that you can follow. And maybe you've got some as well. Share them right down there in the links. We will all want to grow in prayer. Let us learn from you as well. We want your help. While all those memorized and routine prayer times and, and patterns are important to me, what also taught me would be the times that, that I would see my mom or dad just sitting at the table praying. Or driving down the road and they'd have us turn off the radio because there was an emergency vehicle and its lights were on going by and we would pray for them and whatever their, their situation was going on that they were responding to. So I was taught that prayer is not just a habit, it's a way of living and interacting with my Father in heaven. How about you? How did you learn to pray? Maybe you learned it from a parent too, or perhaps you learned a little later in life and only recently have been begun exploring a time of prayer with your Father in heaven. Maybe you don't pray at all. Maybe you don't see the need. Maybe you don't know how to. Maybe you think it doesn't matter. And no matter where you are on the spectrum of satisfaction with your prayer life, we can all be taught a little bit more about it. And I can think of no better person to learn about prayer from than from Jesus himself. After all, if the disciples needed to learn more about prayer and he taught them, I think we could learn more about prayer from Jesus as well. Because when Jesus teaches us to pray, he begins by reminding us first and foremost who it is we are praying to. That you are invited to address the king of the universe, the creator of all things, seen and unseen. And Jesus tells us that we get to call him and address him as our father. Our father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. And the more that we stay here in that part, the more we pause here and know that this is the perfect father that we get to talk to, Friends, the better your time of prayer will be. I once heard a pastor say it this way. I don't know who said it this way first, but, but I still remember it. It wasn't my original thought, but I got to give credit to him if I knew who it was. But uh, they said it this way. He said, you, when it comes to prayer, you got a DSA. DSA, not TSA, that's at the airport. DSA means don't start asking. Don't start asking, DSA. Instead, begin by declaring God's greatness surrendering your will and acknowledging your dependence on him for provision, pardon, and protection. See, Jesus teaches us that this perfect father is, is, is similar to our, our earthly fathers in Luke 11. And he says it this way, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Now, Jesus uses this line of questioning regarding serpents and scorpions and fish to encourage the disciples to understand this kind of simple truth that if, that if sinful earthly fathers know the difference between good and bad gifts for their children and want their children more often than not. There's exceptions, we know, but they want their children to have good gifts. 
How much more does the Father in heaven, the perfect Father, desire to give his children good gifts? And especially, especially, do you hear what Jesus mentioned there? That great gift that for most of us, I can guess, hasn't been on our prayer list very frequently. The gift of the Holy Spirit. See, when it comes to being taught about prayer by Jesus, one of the foremost things we can learn to pray for is for the gift and for the person of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps some of your greatest struggles or your disappointments with your prayer life has something to do with this. The whole aspect of the the Spirit's involvement. See, I don't think you say bad prayers. And don't hear me say that you're, you're praying bad prayers. That's not what I'm saying. Your, your, your father in heaven, he wants to hear the hearts of his children. He wants his children to ask him things. And it doesn't matter what type of words you wear. He wants to hear from you. you. You're not doing it wrong. But my question is, what happens in those moments when the answers to your prayer are not what you want them to be? You get angry? Upset? Maybe you doubt that prayer works? Maybe you start blaming yourself and think that, that your prayers aren't good enough, that you're, that you're not using the right words, or, or even more so, maybe you think you're not good enough to be answered by God. Do you find yourself thinking that you might not be praying for or asking for the right thing? Reminds me of a story I heard about a, a little boy and his mother. And the little boy had been misbehaving and he got sent to his room. And after a while, he emerged and he told his mom that he had thought about it over and that, and that he had even said a prayer about what had happened. And she said to him, fine, fine. If you ask God to help you, son, if you ask him to help you to not misbehave, he will help you. To which the little boy replied, oh, I didn't ask him to help me not misbehave. I asked him to help you put up with me. (laughs) Ever feel like you're praying for the wrong thing and that God is just putting up with you because you're not getting the answers you want in prayer? You know, part of our our biggest struggles with prayer is we forget about the Holy Spirit's role and power in prayer. When we are frustrated with prayer, when we wonder why we need to pray, when we struggle with what to pray, that's a sign to us that what we need more than anything is an intercessor, one who knows what we need even better than what we do, and one who knows the Father better than we do. We need the person of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 says it this way, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And those saints, that, that's you, that's me, that he works on behalf of us. When the disciples ask Jesus to teach them to pray and he ends teaching them on prayer by telling them to ask for the Holy Spirit with the promise that God will give that Holy Spirit because he's a good father and he wants to give good gifts to his children. And, and then the apostle Paul in teaching the church in Rome about prayer and the work of the Holy Spirit tells us why we pray for that Holy Spirit because the Spirit knows the will of God and knows our needs as well. So, how about you? Are you willing and ready to let the Spirit continue to teach you about prayer? But but be aware, praying for the Spirit could completely revolutionize your prayer life. Think of it this way. If the prayer is something that the disciples needed to be taught, what about you? Who's teaching you? And who are you teaching? My prayer is that this week ahead that, that you'll be in this book that you'll be learning more about prayer in the, the seven daily readings that you have going on for as we prioritize prayer. I hope you're in a small group. If you're not in one yet, it'd be a great time to get in one because we're growing in there. And I hope parents and those of you who have children in your life at home will, will practice this with your kids. Will you allow them to catch this prayer life? It's time to start. If you haven't started, don't worry about the past. Today is what you've been given to. Take an opportunity to model for them in your own life, in your life together, the purpose and importance of praying. Your kids are listening and they're watching how you pray. So don't let, don't let one mom's experience be yours. 
It happened when a pastor was talking to a six-year-old boy and, and he said, said to him this, so, so your mom tells me that you say your prayers each night. She says your prayers for you. That's great. What does she say? And the little boy replied, my mom says every night she prays, thank God he's in bed. <laughs> I hope you can show your kids at prayers a lot more about a relationship with the Father in heaven and not just a shout out or a request line. Yet teaching and modeling prayer is not just for parents and kids, it's for for all of us in our interactions in daily life. For example, a friend tells you a burden or shares some bad news that they've just received with you. And and while it's great, I know a lot of us do this, we say that we'll pray for them or we'll add them to our church's prayer list. It's great, but you want to go a step further? Stop right there and then, whatever you're doing, and pray for them and with them. You have an opportunity to be a person who brings intercession before the throne of the Most High God by the power of the Holy Spirit who invites you to call Him Father. And your prayers, your prayers to God can bring direction to this confusing world. They change the world. It it helps not just internally, but but externally as well. Did you know that, this is interesting, did you know that, that if you are married, and you want to improve your intimacy in your marriage, one of the best ways to improve intimacy is to pray together with your spouse. Couples who pray together on a regular basis have a greater level of intimacy than those who don't. Another benefit of prayer. And think about this too. If your prayers have the ability to change the world, then why in the world would you not prioritize prayer? Jesus said this in John 14, 14. I hope you believe him. He says this. He says, you may ask for me anything in my name and I will do it. And Jesus' brother James writes in his letter in James 5, 16, that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. That every day in this world, we get a reset because the world's going to pull you in every, pull you every day and every direction. And so every day we need direction. It's confusing world. There's so many options and rather going to the things of this world, let's go to God. Let's take Luther up with his advice. Let's begin our day. The first thing every do in, every day in prayer, let's go to him. Let's pray first. Let's seek direction from him and let's end our days in prayer as well and find many times during the day to do so as well. Because here's the cool thing. He'll give us direction because God does it. He gives you direction. He answers prayer. James 1 verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. Sometimes prayer is uncomfortable and it's uncomfortable because it acknowledges our helplessness. And we don't want to admit we're helpless. But we are. I am. The reason we come to God in prayer is because we need help. We need him to intervene. We realize we can't tackle this problem in this world on our own. We are powerless in facing some of life's toughest situations that come upon us. We can't fix some of the things that are broken within us with our own power or strength. So we come to him and we say, God, I need you. And we've tried it on our own strength and we couldn't do it. And we're on our knees and we're crying out to God in desperation. And praying to God is admitting, I need you. And when you do that, when you admit, God, I need you, you're declaring two things. You're declaring, first and foremost, you are not God. And secondly, that he is. It's not only thinking of yourself in the proper context, but it's putting God on his throne. Not that he ever got off it, but you just forgot that he was there. So you need to declare that he is greater. He is capable. You are praising him. That's why you got a DSA. Don't start asking. That's why in our prayers, we often start with praise and adoration, with remembering and declaring how good, how strong our God is. Even Jesus in that prayer that he taught us said that before he taught us to ask God of things, you can do that. You can ask, but he encouraged us. He kind of showed us that before we ask for things, before we ask for provision, before we ask for forgiveness, before we ask for the the strength to fight against the temptations of the enemy, to first declare to him, hallowed be your name. Blessed be your name. So as we end our time together today, We're going to do it in a time of reflection. 
A video is going to show here in a moment, and it's going to time for you to, to be able to take a deep breath as it begins. That's important. Take some deep breaths, starting now, in through your nose, out through your mouth. And as the images, and the music, and the words on the screen lead you in a time of guided prayer in the midst of a chaotic world, if there are things in this moment that you want to lift up in prayer, this is the time to do it. Maybe you can invite God to teach you how to pray this week, asking for the Holy Spirit into your heart, into your life, to teach you to pray anew and afresh. For we pray not as we ought, but as we are able, and we need the Spirit's help. The disciples saw the peace and the strength Jesus received throughout his life from prayer. So they wanted to learn to pray like that. And friends, Jesus is willing to teach you to pray. Are you admit to willing that you need to learn? I am. So take some deep breaths. And take this moment for these next few minutes in the midst of the noise in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the confusion, in the midst of the burdens, to come to your Father, your perfect Father, who's called you by name and who invites you to come to him, weary and heavy laden with the promise of rest and the invitation to learn from him and to live a life that is modeled after Jesus with unforced rhythms of grace. So breathe in and breathe out and let us pray.